Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Alan Lumsden. I'm the medical director at Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center here in Houston. So welcome to CV Live. Uh, this is the first of a series of webcasts that's going to be coming to you from uh, the DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center. And we're deep in the heart of Texas. And so this is the inaugural uh, webcast. And I'm joined here with my friend and colleague, Dr. Jolt Garami. And he's one of the world's experts uh, in transcranial Doppler monitoring. So tonight we're going to talk about cerebral embolization. It's the hot topic in the interventional cardiovascular space. A lot of people denied this was a problem. No, it's a focus uh, as a complication for a lot of the intervention. So thank you for being here, Dr. Garami. And tell, before we get started, tell me a little bit about you. I know you trained in Budapest. How did you develop this interest in transcranial Doppler and how did you end up in the United States? Well, thank you for having me and thank you for hiring me. <laughs> I think uh, that's why I'm here and I'm uh, uh, one of the first uh, uh, physicians you hired when you started to rebuild the department. Uh, before that, uh, I, after my graduation from Hungary, I was really interested in stroke and this is where I did some stroke research, imaging research. <coughs> in Salt Lake City and next door uh, with Dr. Grota and uh, with Dr. Alexandrov. And I think uh, learning more about the transcranial Doppler, that was my focus, actually my thesis. So even in medical school, I kind of looked at this like, this is a really fancy technique and we were practicing on each other as uh, medical students. And uh, from that, I think it uh, became one of my passion. And, and I think to uh, able to understand what is the Doppler signal tells you almost like you really need to speak the Doppler language. So I got that. So with that, it's a perfect introduction because what I want to do is try and help the audience speak the Doppler language. For some reason or other, it seems very confusing to people. Um, if I can have my first slide, please, I'm going to actually try and set some of the background for why we think transcranial Doppler is extremely important. Okay, so. For a long time, you and I have struggled and said, this is an important way of looking at blood supply inside the head in a variety of circumstances. But our interest, of course, is actually when we're doing procedures from anything on the left side of the heart, the aortic valve, the ascending aorta, all the way up into the carotid arteries, it's important. But when I saw this publication that came out in 2017, I suddenly realized that your moment had come to shine. Because this is a publication, and if you look at the authors that are on here, these are people from the TAVR world. So all of a sudden, TAVR has created a great focus on what happens inside the head. Why? Now, remember, a lot of people have been telling us, don't tell me about this embolization stuff. It doesn't really matter, because these patients wake up, don't have an obvious stroke. And my answer to that was, okay, Try and explain to me what the good emboli are that are going on up in your head. And if you can define that, then maybe we'll try and work on that. So there are no good emboli which go on up in your head. And what this is, and this is the Lansky publication, they basically came out with a proposed standard neurological classification for cardiovascular and endpoints for cardiovascular clinical trials. This can potentially transform our world. And what they were doing, this is an abstract, that essentially what they were saying was, and if you read this, is that the primary mechanism for procedure-related stroke is focal or multifocal embolization during cardiovascular instrumentation. Now, they're not just talking about TABR. They're talking about coronary artery bypass, open aortic valves. Those are the kind of cardiovascular uh, instrumentation events that can occur. And that diffuse cerebral hyperperfusion, in other words, shutting off the blood supply to your head, you know, it happens, but it's really not as a less common cause. Well, you know, when we do open heart surgery, all we do is measure for global hyperperfusion. But the most common events are embolic. None of the currently used systems tell you about embolization. And yet, everyone acknowledges that's the most important thing. So all of a sudden, you know, Lansky comes up with a whole new classification system for stroke. And they say that type 1 stroke is a lesion in your brain and a clinical manifestation, paralysis, hemiplegia, for example. But type 2 stroke, you know, moving on to that, type 2 stroke, they are defining as a diffusion-weighted MR positive lesion in the absence of clinical symptoms. And very provocatively, they describe that as covert CNS infarction. 
Now you tell me, infarction means dead brain, isn't, isn't that right? So again, all these little embolic particles that everybody said, not a big deal, don't worry about it, are killing your brain cells. Now, smart people like you may have an excess of these things, it doesn't make any difference whether we take out half a million or a million, but you know, when, when you get up in age, you don't have that many of these things basically left over to deal with. So covert CNS infarction, they're saying equals dead brain, and that we must mitigate that. And actually, if you look at what they describe as the pyramid of the frequency, the biggest component of this happens to be the base of that pyramid, and that's type two infarction, almost always from emboli that are actually occurring. So, what you've been saying all along is that embolization is the problem, all of a sudden you got all of those people who are co-authors who are in fundamental agreement with you, and now what? And not only that, as they're saying, you guys, those like me in this interventional cardiovascular space, you got to change something. Okay, this business as usual ain't going to cut it. And so we obviously happen to agree with them. And as far as I'm aware, the only way of monitoring a procedure and looking at embolization is transcranial Doppler. And that's kind of what we're here a little bit to talk about tonight. So again, all of a sudden, you know, Tava shines a spotlight on this problem. And every device company and their grandmother is out now basically creating another device that you and I can buy to try and prevent this from happening. And they, they are categorized into two groups, those which simply deflect the emboli away from the head and those which tend to trap them. And these are just a sample of the examples of things basically that are up there. Now I know that you kind of went to Europe and uh, you were actually involved in the umbrella trial doing transcranial Doppler monitoring, the device doesn't exist anymore, and that there's also you know, just because you put an embolization protection device doesn't guarantee you that you're going to prevent this. In fact, we don't really even know how much of a guarantee this actually exists. We've got some evidence from the carotid world. For example, CMS will not even pay for a carotid stent unless you use it with an embolization uh, protection system. And so, you know, there's some data out there to suggest that that's the case. So. Why is this concept being so difficult for people like you and I to persuade the people who are watching out there that this is something that should be being done, okay? So I think of this as the stethoscope to the brain. I'm gonna try and put this kind of in layman's terms, but it's got a lot more capability. Nobody argues that the should we throw away the stethoscopes? Well, some people might think you know, that that may be the case. But you can listen and you hear sounds, and you can hear flow sometimes, or you can do an echo, and you can hear basically flow. And so what you're going to show us is the ability to essentially put that stethoscope in your head mm -hmm. and to be able to look at flow, all, and, and it uses a two megahertz frequency probe with a pulse wave Doppler in order to be able to do this. Now, to those of you out there who do peripheral vascular interventions, and what you're going to see here is that, that's here, we're playing some sound here, is that nobody would argue that if you're going to do lower extremity interventions, that you put a probe down on your ankle and you listen to it, okay? Everybody would say that's malpractice. We don't measure ankle pressures and listen to flow in the legs. And yet, same people are arguing you don't need to do it in your brain. Now, so what's more important to you? Listen to flow in your feet or listen to flow in your brain? So that's one way, basically, of trying to present this. And so. Essentially what you're doing, so you actually think that um, creation knew the transcranial Doppler was coming down the line. And so they built a system by which they aligned the middle cerebral artery, the anterior cerebral artery, the anterior cerebral artery on the opposite side, and the middle cerebral artery, so that you could fire one beam straight across and interrogate all of those blood vessels that are up there. That's remarkable, because they're all basically in a straight line. And so, this is an example of putting a probe on the middle cerebral artery and firing that Doppler beam down into the left middle cerebral artery and you get a flow signal from it. And that's really what we're demonstrating up here. And when you press on it, it decreases and when you release it, you get a reactive hyperemia and then it comes back down. There's a lot of auto regulation and what that map in the top left really is just, you don't get that from transcranial Doppler but it's kind of showing you, you know, what that means in terms of basically a flow up into your brain. and so. What happens is that it, what we see in this middle panel is what you're going to demonstrate for us, and that is the ability to actually acquire that Doppler signal. And the depth, which equals that line that you can see in the top right-hand corner, is the depth of the blood vessels from the skull. And by adjusting that depth, adjusting this yellow line, takes you deeper and deeper into the head, 
may even take you across the midline, and that allows you to acquire that Doppler signal. Same as just putting in a Doppler sample box uh, when we're doing duplex. It lets you select the area that we want to interrogate. So I think of that yellow line as your sample box on a duplex scan. And so we can acquire all this information you know, when we're doing transcranial Doppler. And it lets you look at normal blood flow. It lets you see the presence of flow. It, you can interrogate from what depth, the direction of flow, the speed of flow, the resistance. And oh, by the way, if there's something wrong with it, it shows you how blood reroutes inside the head. And you can tell us that real time or when it's been occluded. And perhaps even more importantly for this topic today, it will show you particles. And so when you see these yellow lines, they're traveling from deep in the brain to the surface. So it, it's on an angle because the x-axis is time. So it's traveling from deep to superficial and you can detect that. And that's really going to focus what we're going to talk about. So for the audience out there regarding cerebral blood flow, let's say it's you that's on the operating room table. And let's say basically I'm putting a stent graft or a crowd in you. Would you like me to know whether we're pa passing particles up in your brain or just ignore it? Would you like to know that there's ongoing flow going up in your head, or should we just ignore it? Would you like me to know now, or 20 minutes from now? Well, it seems we hold these truths to be self-evident. Clearly, when you're dealing with your brain, it's real important to know what is going on, you know, real time. And so, Thomas Jefferson said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, much like the pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. All righty. So... I would like you to switch over onto Dr. Grammy's slides, because at this point, basically, we're going to talk about, I'm going to turn this over to the expert, and he is going to teach us about cerebral embolization and transcranial Doppler. So over to you, Dr. Grammy. Thank you. Um, <coughs> uh, we are going to have just a uh, second. Take a break. <coughs> yeah. So we're going to switch computers, and while he's doing that, um, I think it's, I think this is a fascinating technology. I think it's a technology that we, you know, with those of us in the interventional world, need to really know something about. And so, yeah, you're going to use a bunch of case examples and illustrate, you know, why this is important. So over to Zolt. Okay. Um, first, um, I definitely would like to tell you that on my uh, way to have my interview with you for my job. I had the pleasure to travel with Dr. DeBakey together. Mm -hmm. So this is on uh, old time on the continental flight. Uh, we had the pleasure of saving a patient with a medical emergency and, and I felt that this is why we are a team and this is why I'm happy to be here. So and let me interrupt you and, and say that's not entirely the story. The entire story is that uh, Dr. Grammy saw Dr. DeBakey go to the bathroom you know, on the continental flight and realized he was coming to Houston and ambushed him coming out of the, uh, the small bathrooms on the United flight and made him pose to get a picture. So that's the real story behind the guy here. <laughs> um, luckily, the background uh, doesn't tell you that side of the story. But uh, I'm really proud that uh, I think while we're in Houston, we definitely have uh, also different uh, uh, disclosure just written a love of ultrasound and I think uh, another picture shows you that when the astronaut comes home uh, from space we are attacking him with any ultrasound we can so we do a carotid uh, eye and a heart ultrasound at the same time um, first I just want to show you are proud to be in the Walter Tower brand new suite uh, this is where my ultrasound is sitting at the patient head and I want to show you my fancy 3d videos uh, to take you to the operating room. So we are live uh, monitoring one of your case, uh, a carotid stenting, and this is where I'm sitting and uh, interacting with anesthesia team, interacting with the surgeons and uh, rest of the surgical team. And, and I think it's very important that uh, we are communicating what is the TCD finding uh, directly uh, with you. Um, so I think that's important because, you know, as you show putting the head frame on, um, Dr. Grammy is a physician and so he has a lot of knowledge about the procedures because it's not just looking at the TCD signal, it's interpreting what is going on inside the head in relation to what the physician is doing. So you're watching what we're doing continuously and continuously communicating with us about, hey, this is good, this is bad, change something. Yeah. And I think it's very important that uh, with our video recording we really can link uh, 
uh, what's really happening on the field and also on the ultrasound equipment. Uh, can you imagine how many computers in the room? None of yep. them is synced. So you have t tremendous different hours uh, running on the clock. But here what you see is that I place the head frame on the patient who is awake. Again, uh, the patient is not complaining that I'm hurting the patient. And uh, after the uh, really tight placement of the head frame, I'm positioning the probe just front of the ear. And if you feel just on yourself front of the ear, there's a tiny, tiny dent. This is where I'm positioning my probe. Um, this is where the bone is a little bit thinner and the ultrasound can, can pass. And as you can see, by tiny adjustment, I can get a better signal. And on uh, upper screen, uh, you start so to see... So the low-frequency probe is designed to penetrate. Does everybody? Can you do this on everybody? Mm. Um, I think so. Uh, definitely, we have some issues with ladies. I think we think the ladies are hard-headed. Oh, and, my gosh. Um, that's going to kill me. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> but that's the true. I think it's something to do with the osteoporotic... Uh, uh, air pockets in the bone. Yeah. Somehow the ultrasound is uh, deflected and, and we just can't get uh, very good signals. But what you can see here that when we get the perfect signal, you can see how the signal is so blunted. You showed us the perfect book cases that this is how the signal is supposed to look like. I'm showing you this is how our patient signal looks like and this is you can tell immediately uh, matching the MC and also the AC which is a potential collateral for the disease. And based on this signal, I can tell you that this carotid is definitely had a significant disease because of blunted signal. Okay, so you for a layman, I'd say that it looks like that's not a good signal. Your oh. systolic upstroke disappeared. Yeah. So let's make that as like a number one rule that in the moment your systolic upstroke disappeared between your measurement point and your heart, there is a blockage of significant stenosis. But you're also telling us that the epsilateral anterior cerebral artery is reversed. Yes. So, so remember, if even if you're color blind yeah. you can still see the positive negative direction on the spectrum so but definitely there's a red signal here at the, the depth of 60 to 70 which is the your reversed ACNL. but what you're telling me is that a significant carotid stenosis there's ample blood supply in the middle of cerebral artery but most of that is coming across the anterior communicating artery and the expectation then is that if you fix this problem you will find that uh, epsilateral anterior cerebral artery reverses back to how it should be, and that basically should go blue. So you're going to show, you're going to, you can tell us that real time. Yes, and I think this is the evidence of how, just not the direct uh, uh, MC recording, but able to show the uh, 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 collateral pathway. Mm -hmm. I think it's helping us. And uh, one of the uh, issue we have is um, how the TCD so operator. Uh, dependent, and uh, we are trying to uh, make a. Uh, so you're going to show us this robot here. And I think that's important that we actually show that. And so, and, and the reason for showing this is that um, is is that the two c uh, criticisms we get are number one, who's going to put the head frame on, how skilled do they need to be, and then who's going to monitor it. And so that's basically one of the issues that we continually hear as a criticism of this technology. And so you're going to show us what. I'm going to show you that uh, how I can uh, find uh, the middle cerebrotary signal with a robot. Um, this uh, robot is basically going to uh, find us a signal bilateral at the same time. So this is almost like cutting my signal finding half if I am cannot do it or okay, cutting so one guy out of the circulation. Yes. So always leave the audience you know, with anticipation. So you're going to take a little break for a minute before you actually show us um, <laughs> what that robot actually does. I really hate commercial breaks. Hello, I'm William Zogby, Chair of the Department of Cardiology at Houston Methodist DeBakey and Heart and Vascular Center. I'd like to invite you to join us in Houston, Texas for the ninth annual Multimodality Cardiovascular Imaging for the Clinician. This special event will be held on February 22nd to 24th, 2019 at the Houston Methodist Research Institute in the Texas Medical Center. Cardiovascular imaging plays a vital role in the management of cardiovascular patients. Knowledge of the various imaging modalities is indeed critical in understanding their advantages, limitations, and appropriate utilization. This is in patients with ischemic heart disease, heart failure, cardiomyopathy, valvular heart disease, as well as aortic disease. In addition to didactic lectures by world experts from this country and abroad, this two and a half day symposium offers small group tutorials, each imaging modality, 
demonstrating heart anatomy to better visualize and understand cardiac and valvular structures, along with other imaging modalities. The course is designed for physicians, mid-levels, nurses, trainees specializing in cardiovascular disease. We also encourage nurses, sonographers, imaging technologists, and echocardiographers, cardiac CT, and MRI specialists to attend. I hope you will join us for this conference and look forward to seeing you in Houston in February. For more details, please visit our website. So you just heard from Dr. Zogby, um, who is the program chair for multimodality imaging. Um, and one of the things we'll be talking about there actually is transcranial Doppler. So we left you uh, talking about a robot. But before we go to robotic acquisition, Dr. Grammy here is going to demonstrate a little bit about how, in the absence of a robot, we do transcranial Doppler monitoring. So, so take it over. So I'm just testing, testing how nervous I am, basically just monitoring my own blood flow. As so I can you show us the probe? Just hold the probe up. So it's pretty unsophisticated. It's uh, like a pencil. Yep. And I'm holding it as a pencil. Yeah. And I'm positioning it just front of my ear. And uh, basically the idea is that I'm angling up and anteriorly. So I'm trying to find a signal. And based on the sound. So you're I alive? Mm -mm. Yes. We got a heartbeat. But mm -mm. I would like to show you a cool Valsalva maneuver. Okay. Before I pass out, I'm just yeah. releasing it. So, so the I'm idea is that you hyperventilate, you uh, do what? And this is how I'm testing my autoregulation. Make right. sure my hemodynamics are working and this oil looks like it's a mic. So it's picking up all my voice too. Oh, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is where this two megahertz signal reflects all the ultrasound signal from your red blood cells. Yep. So anything is coming towards is red, going away is blue. And again, if anything else travels with the red blood cells, give you a bloop. Luckily, I couldn't demonstrate an ambulance no for you. Yeah. <laughs> you can't even, <laughs> but you that can't would be an ambulance <laughs> signal. Uh, well, next time, I arrange for you to have a few emboli, you know, <laughs> while we're doing this, so we can really convince people. Yeah. But I think it's really simple, two megahertz probe, and I think if we will make it uh, 1.5, maybe we wouldn't have so a problem with uh, uh, going with this 10% no window case. Okay. that able to get uh, everybody? Are people working on making a lower frequency probe? Yes. So um, actually, uh, definitely, uh, that's the other approach. We're trying to differentiate solid and air particles to so use two different frequencies. So how much does something like this cost? I know Spencer Technologies got taken over by which company? Neuroanalytics. Neuroanalytics. So. Roughly, I mean, we spend $2 million on an MRI machine, you know, $600,000 on the CT scan, you know, $250,000 on a big ultrasound machine. What does that cost? Uh, roughly around 35000 Is that all? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so, so it's, it's so not it's a big investment In, in the world sure. of, you know, hospital expenditures, this is a remarkably cheap device. As reference, uh, another duplex ultrasound machine for all the vascular uh, or an echo machine runs 150, 200,000 right. uh, range. So it's interesting, I heard recently that one of the most cost effective interventions in patients who have ischemic strokes is to suck the clot out of their head um, and revascularize them. I mean, in a way, if we thought of this as a stroke prevention e piece of equipment, it's gotta be the most cost effective piece of equipment that exists in any hospital anywhere. Uh, not only that, but when, when we learn how to detect MC occlusion, uh, we able to select those patients who needed that intervention. Yep. Uh, one of the first uh, time I detected uh, uh, MCA, I run into a paper when I think of in a PROEX study, you had to scan a thousand people to find a hundred right. MC occlusion. So that was a 900 other NGO unnecessary done mm -hmm. because you couldn't find MC occlusion. With this so ultrasound, you can select those and you can define where those occlusions are. So I'm not sure if you're going to show this case, but it certainly comes to my mind. One of the towers that here, you detect an intraoperative MCA occlusion. Unequivocally. Uh, that patient went immediately um, to go ahead, they seem to have a neuro rescue, and that must be one of the fastest neuro rescues in history to be able to pick up something like that. I'm going to show that after the Great. next commercial break. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. But first I would like to show you what a robot does. 
So again, what the robot does, it's bilaterally able to find the signal. So those big white boxes on either side are the, we're yes. looking straight down on the patient here. He's not rolled on his side, is he? Uh, no, actually, he's laying down. Yeah. I'm standing at the head, and this is a yeah. small uh, screen on the left upper corner, uh, just showing you how does it look like to really set it up in the fast, probably in two minutes. So this is just speed up a little bit to don't uh, 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 waste time on the long videos. But the whole idea is that within two minutes we're able to find the signal. And here uh, what you see is uh, that the head frame is uh, holding the patient head. This is the initialization of the probes. So before we uh, 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 use uh, on the patient. Uh, the so that uh, little black thing on our side. This is exactly is the, the same the ultrasound probes. probe. I just hold okay. it in my hand. Oh, is exactly that right? the mm -hmm. same yeah. size. It just positioned and know the robot is moving that and the robot uh, mm -hmm. providing the whole movement and the signal finding. Um, and this is how it looks like when it's on the patient in the background, you'll be able to see the ultrasound itself. And uh, this was the case with the, the together, and this is actually one of the first uh, commercial uh, robotic case when we monitored a uh, left uh, carotid stenting. And uh, uh, maybe it's cut off here, you don't see it on the bottom, but uh, the, when the waveform is changed, that was remarkable. So and what we are we able looking to at there? Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, the other position, again, we are trying to monitor any other uh, blood vessels here. We can uh, monitor the uh, submandibular ICA, uh, this is um, actually my testing how my vertebral uh, is looking. Uh, the whole idea that you will able to see these two different signals that what is your middle cerebral artery and what is your submandibular IC shows at the same time. Okay. So we can link the but that's same not vessel. Routine. Mm. No, this is our fancy. Okay. Uh, this is actually our, our idea how we can monitor okay. the submandibular IC and MCA together so on the same side. So my job here is to make sure this is simple. Um, what are those funky looking numbers up and down the left side of the screen there? Uh, well, you pointed out very well that the 45, uh, this is the depth of so the yellow the line. the top panel is right side, we're talking right side, left side here, is that what we're looking no, at? Uh, no, the submandibular is blue oh, because okay. it's going away from your probe. All right, let's this forget submandibular because that's so unusual. Okay. Uh, let's it's focus on confusing. the middle cerebral artery. Yeah. What was unique that I wanted to show you how the embolus from the ICA gets to the MCA. This is the distance ah, between the two probe, okay. and I think it's stunning. Uh, this is not magic and not Photoshop. For some reason, this one piece of emboli became two when it arrived to the brain. That's another thing tells you how uh, dynamics works, that even with the big embolus became it's two. Really interesting. So this is by the blood pressure. This is how they're hitting bifurcations. But I think the timing from the submandibular to the MCA. This is how long does it take? And one of the reason I want to show you why they are uh, humanly sig uh, not significant, these microemboli, because what goes out, what goes up to the brain needs to come out. These are the embolus signal recorded now in the jugular. All right, very confusing for me. Okay, this let's go back to the basics. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what, but you're telling me that you can see one particle in the internal carotid artery. Or two, depends on, I can count them. Okay. So this is two different signals. And then you can see two different white line, mm -hmm. and behind. What's the y-axis? I mean, that's time. Uh, this is time. This is about four seconds. Okay. The whole screen is four seconds. Yes. So sir. this is half a second, and traveling between the internal carotid and the MCA. Yes. Okay. Sir. Very good. All right. So I'm going to show you when we are in the operating room. We can also differentiate and teach ourselves how is a good. Whoa. Oh. That's not good. Why don't you take another commercial break? <laughs> Oops. No, you can't move. Hello, my name is Alan Lumsden. I'm the chairman of the Department of Cardiovascular Surgery here at Houston Methodist Hospital. And I'm Zvonimir Krajer, current president of the International Society of Endovascular Specialists. We are excited to invite you to join us for our first annual ISEVS Symposium. This premier conference will take place at the Houston Methodist Research Institute in the Texas Medical Center. This is a two and a half day conference and it will offer didactic lectures from well-renowned cardiovascular interventionists. It will also feature intensive hands-on workshops designed to teach interventionists a variety of techniques. We plan to offer three tracks, one for the novice or the uh, new young surgeon or young interventionist, an intermediate track and an advanced track. That means you can hone your skills at an individualized level. 
By the end of the conference, attendees should be ready to apply these techniques and improve their clinical practice. We hope you will join us and we look forward to seeing you in September. Okay, so sorry about that and welcome back to CV Live. And uh, you've just seen the little uh, promotion for the ISEVS inaugural symposium, which is going to run here in September. So we're planning to run the biggest hands-on endovascular program in history. Um, and so if you need to learn endovascular skills, that's the meaning to come to. So we're going to jump forward and talk about how I really kind of got involved with uh, Dr. Grammy, and we monitored a lot of carotid endarterectomies. And so bottom line is what we're going to do is open up the carotid, clamp the carotid. There have been all these dogmas in the vascular surgery world about when we should shunt patients, most of them are wrong, because when you actually measure the flow, all you really care is about what is going on up inside your head. And so you're going to get an idea here of what he can tell us um, yeah, when we need to shunt a patient and what's going on inside the head. So over to you, Dr. Grammy. I would like to show you an example, and this is a bilateral uh, monitoring uh, this is where uh, we see the uh, we are working and touching the carotid even for a one heartbeat. Okay, you again, the so change. do me a favor. Just I want to make sure everybody understands this. Your yellow line is the depth from the surface. And you've got that set, I can't see what it is from here, 50, 55 millimeters. Yes. And uh, so that Doppler tracing, that waveform is coming from the middle cerebral artery up above where we're going to clamp and we are not going to change it. So that's another cool idea that we, with the head frame position, you're able to monitor the same signal, the same depth. So you like to avoid any angle correction changes or any anything. Okay. So this is why the head frame is helping us to position and hold the probe in the same position for the entire case. Okay, go ahead. So what happens? And uh, this is four screenshot, and I just want to walk you through that. Uh, here you see the, uh, the right, and this is the left side and just with uh, manipulation or heartbeat changes, you see that, but when we put the clamp on, that's an obvious change. And this is when you do not have any collaterals, probably here your AC did not reverse and your ophthalmic is not helping too much. This MCA um, is definitely um, lost probably 80% of the flow and definitely you need to put the shunt. So the baseline uh, flow, flow velocity is 70 to 80 centimeters a second? Uh, so basically on the screen that delta percentage displayed uh, how we start the surgery and we uh, try to monitor Okay, so show me what the delta changes. percentage is. The delta percentage is this number. Okay, so that's a baseline number. Exactly. And it shows you percentage change from baseline. Yes, and uh, we uh, here you see it's down to 28 from so 70. But again, this is from the baseline, 100% is a significant change. And what is that a definition of significant? Uh, we are uh, driving uh, our criteria uh, based on Dr. Spencer's work uh, from Seattle. Uh, if you have more than 50% drop, uh, we just shunt. Uh, 50 so to 30 percent drop, okay. you can increase right. the map and be able to come up. And I will show you an example how with 30 seconds you can really bring the flow up. Here you cannot bring the flow up. You can see there is no collaterals at all. By placing the shunt, you're able to restore flow. But it's interesting, it's up to about 70 okay. percent. You're never going to reach back the 100 percent okay. because your size of the vessel. But you're happy with shunt. that. I'm extremely happy and I do not see emboli. That's always a good point. Okay, good. And uh, one of the keys uh, when I want to show you next, uh, this is when I can alert you that, well, the shunt is not flowing. So it shunts in, but it's and it's not, not come back up. Exactly. So there's something wrong with it. So we have so to jiggle the exactly. shunt. Exactly. So this is where you can see that the middle separatory flow, the red signal is gone. Sometimes it goes to blue that it's even reversing for that moment. And this is where you need to position uh, the shunt better to, to able to get the signal. So often what surgeons do is they put the shunt in, it almost fills with blood. So it looks like there's this little plastic straw with blood flowing in it, but it could be static blood. And so a lot of us would put a Doppler signal, a Doppler probe on it to make sure that there's flow. You'd, I don't need to do that if you're monitoring this. Exactly, and also from the sound, you won't be able to quantify that flow. So okay. you cannot tell Good. if 50% and 100%. Excellent point. Excellent point. Hadn't thought uh, the other beauty I would like to show you then when we have, uh, again, a signal <laughs> with hyperemia, when we have doubling the flow at the end of the surgery, that's another important finding. 
uh, patients usually complain headache. A worst case, we have seizures. Yep. Uh, this is where we can play with a little bit of pressure lowering and hyperventilation. We can bring down the flow, and that's again in within two minutes we can play with autoregulation and Good. and we can definitely use the muscles in our. So you're. This has been so stimulating that somebody on the line wants to ask you a question. So uh, please go ahead and ask the question for Dr. Garami. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Garami. Can you tell me what the smallest size um, emboli TCD contracts and how does that correlate see. to the type 2 stroke classification? You and still have a caller? Part of that was <laughs> All right. Yes, can you and hear they're me? They're not there anymore. So go ahead, keep going, Zolt, and then we'll, we'll um, pick them up in a minute. If they another call back. beauty I want to show you when you have bilateral carotid stenosis. So look at this signal. What does it tell you? That so you're so much depending on one carotid flow that oh, you're mm. it's another. So let's crush. see if we can get the uh, the caller on the line now. <laughs> yeah, I just but want to restart the. Do we have the caller? <laughs> I can yes, hello. Yeah, hello. Hey, go ahead. Please ask the question, Dr. Question. Garami. Yeah. Question for Dr. Garami. What's the smallest size embolus TCD can track? And what's the smallest size embolus a filter can catch? And how does that correlate to a type 2 stroke classification? Okay, so multiple questions for you. Need to reboot this, by the way. Reboot the keynote. Um, is that s you can show emboli, but what are the size of the emboli that can be picked up using transcranial Doppler? So the red blood cells usually about seven micron. So you can pick up uh, as small as uh, ten micron, and probably smaller. And uh, when we uh, see the microembolic signal passing the hundred micron size filters, that's the reason. So we can definitely go uh, and able to detect those tiny, tiny emboli they are passing those filter sizes. Okay, and how big a particle? will cause a type 2 stroke? Well, if you think about the capillary system, if you are 20 micron, you will have problem going through those capillaries. The capillaries, sometimes we can size it to the red blood cells. And I think that's uh, one of our interests too, that uh, we really cannot answer how many emboli you need for a type 2 stroke. Uh, it would be really interesting to so learn the number of emboli it takes. How, how are you going to do that? I mean, this is something you and I have talked about. Any bright ideas, generally, <laughs> without going into the details? Uh, yes, uh, we set up a circuit when we're able to show, uh, again, known size particles and uh, able to show uh, what is the 40 micron size emboli look like, uh, what's the 200 size micro emboli look like. And also, uh, after that, we're able to show that in a uh, animal model, then we can definitely take that animal to our MRI scanner and able to scan them immediately. So we are working on these flow models, we're able to test them, and I think uh, uh, we'll have an answer for you soon. Shortly. Okay. So did, did he answer your questions? All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for your question. And let us know if anybody else calls in. Oh, we have another caller on the line. Yeah, go ahead, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Or I can hear you. Hi, Dr. Lomitan, Dr. Lomitan, thank you for uh, allowing me this opportunity. So you guys touched on how transcranial Doppler can be used to detect emboli during uh, TAVR or transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Uh, we don't have TCD at our hospital, um, and we certainly don't do any TAVRs, but what else uh, can you use TCD for? Like, what are the other clinical applications? Uh, what do you use it for on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in, say, a community hospital? Yeah, so... Let's say you were in a hospital that's not doing TAVR. What other applications could you use this for? And the other question is, how, how, can, how can somebody get trained in how to do this? Uh, basically, um, our operation with the multiple sonographer uh, in our hospital, uh, we provide service for the neuro ICU uh, for mm -hmm. vasospasm monitoring. Um, the uh, neurology service... Uh, uh, one of our favorite tests is the PFO when we are pre-screening people for cardiology to help them to identify those PFOs. Sometimes they are missing on the transthoracic or So, do you think you're more sensitive than uh, bubble echo and picking up 
Absolutely. And even oh Dr. My Q gosh, admitted that's it. Create uh, controversy. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, with Dr. Q, uh, we yeah. had a case that mm -hmm. we showed that we didn't leave the room until uh, the ECHO and the TCD agreed. And I think that's okay. another simultaneous way. The two ultrasound is friendly. So we can definitely work together with the ECHO and the TCD on the head with the same injection. So you can see what is the injection going to the brain or not. That's a nice indirect demonstration uh, of the PFO. And we are 3D. Okay. Um, so that's where the 3D but pattern. But other examples would be carotid endarterectomy, carotid stenting, um, even coronary bypass. They raise this because one of the main flags in the STS database is stroke rate. It's reported. Now, we're not talking about type 2 stroke rate. We're talking about type 1 stroke rate. And that's, you know, 1, 2 percent. And so I'd imagine if you start imaging um, the head and patients who have coronary bypass or surgical valves, it, it's probably, we know it's fairly significant. Okay, so go ahead, Zoll. I want to uh, actually keep, skip my slides, and I want to show you that remarkable case uh, Thank we, you. Mm -hmm. we wanted to see. And this is the during the TAVR uh, when we are crossing the arch, we able to, uh, so uh, this is a real-time recording of the right and the left side. And what you so, see- So what's the procedure? This is a TAVR? TAVR. And the device is being brought up across the aortic arch? Yes, and this is a core valve. And these are the uh, uh, blood pressure valves at the same time. And as you can tell, the arch, the core valve is now here, crossing the arch. And you started to see unilateral embolization on the left side. Reference, right side, not much embolization, and also the hmm. signal didn't change. So that is, uh, I think, the unilateral blood flow and also the velocity change. And, and so uh, you think it was because the tower was right and right across the origin of the left carotid there, the uh, device? But if you keep your eye on, uh, when it's past it, there's no flow remaining, and I think your waveform is disappeared. And yeah. one of the troubleshoot first, oh, make sure the probe is still in the right place. So I think yeah. you're really okay. troubleshooting. Uh, the probe is in the right place when you lose the signal and you still see embolization. This is a unique way of with a uh, MC occlusion, you start to see a tiny blood clot still coming up from that uh, okay. uh, occlusion. And what we, when we diagnose within 30 minutes later, we're able to uh, retrieve this clot. Right. So just a moment, I want to go back and tell you one more. This is yeah. Right. Keep going forward. Yeah. Uh, this is 20 the case. minutes left. <laughs> This is my other case that I would like to show you that when you don't see the MCA flow on both sides, so both sides is missing, you have to blame the So this is another tower, and all of a sudden there's no blood supply in the head? Yes, sir. So you are positioning it, and usually this is not a rapid pacing or not a fancy way of uh, looking at hyperperfusion, but you do not have a signal, and this time anesthesia probably alerting us that uh, there's not much blood pressure they would be able to detect. And this is when we uh, initiate uh, uh, wait, CPR. Wait, wait. So, so there's no blood supply in the head because the patient's having a cardiac arrest? Oh, I see there's some hands there on the chest, okay. Yes, and this you can tell that uh, not just me being nervous, but if you have a fellow nervous, definitely they want to make sure that the hand is on the right place. But here comes your senior surgeon. So, so the CPR was in progress, and there's still no blood flow in the head? Mm. Well, you see tiny spikes, but not much. So I think that's another area of that you can really measure the effectiveness of, and this is again, a synced recording, yeah. what's happening on the table and what's happening so in your brain. So that's very powerful. So CPR is in progress, but not much blood supply to the brain. And luckily the person getting tired and we called for the next CPR person, uh, which is uh, happened to be a senior surgeon, you see those spikes? Yeah. Suddenly we started to see flow. And I think this is where you initiating the carbidopulmonary bypass, you also see too much bubbles well, Cardiopulmonary bypass? <laughs> yes, this is how we save this patient. Okay, so, here so CPR, now we're on cardiopulmonary bypass. But and too much air. Yeah, okay. And immediately port, we turn the, uh, the carbidopulmonary machine off and we check the connectors. After checking the connectors, we slowly, slowly increasing the flow and we avoided all that shower. So I think that's, the, again, the immediate communication. You saw the interaction and how we can change management and not okay. to pump too the much air uh, Very good. when we are restarting. The show us some other examples. I uh, just it. want to go backwards uh, for a moment, oh. and I want to show you, again, the first step uh, when you are uh, crossing a valve during a tavern. 
So this is a wire trying to go through your calcified valve. Look at that shower of emboli, what you see. This is again, just poking on the calcified valve, you can see. And we have a rule that after two minutes you can cross it. We have another uh, 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 surgeon or cardiologist going to uh, try it. And I think uh, this is uh, a uh, interesting. So who's better? The surgeon or the cardiologist, in your opinion? I do not remember. Probably best not to answer that. Yes, one. and <laughs> I do not remember exactly uh, whose hand is uh, at the end of the wire, but I think <laughs> it's a really good measurement. And oops, now you got through. All right. Stunning. And I think this is uh, uh, the next same case. I'm going to show you when. Uh, so I would be very worried about deploying this valve if just poking it with a wire was causing active embolization. <laughs> And it's really interesting that how this calcified, and, and watch this. This is a balloon coming up with a rapid oh, pacing. Oh, so now you've lost flow, huh? As soon as the balloon goes up. Yeah. You didn't okay. lose the flow. You just uh, rapid pacing. Uh, you decrease your cardiac output, and now your balloon is uh, uh, deflated, and you'll see a little bit of emboli coming. That, again, tells you what are the different time of when you see a uh, microemboli signal, and you can define throughout the surgery. And here comes, that here comes your valve. Yeah. This is uh, the adverse recipient, and it's coming through your arch. Surprise, surprise. So through the arch traveling, you did see a few uh, emboli as well, but you didn't lose the signal. So the signal uh, continuously appearing, that assure you that your middle MC, uh, middle cerebral artery is still open. Again, here is where we are positioning. By just positioning in that calcified valve. Lots of emboli. Lots of emboli. Lots, shower, of, lots of emboli. And we can't even count them. So this is where we just say more than 15 per heartbeat. Uh, when you have a shower of emboli, you suddenly won't be able to accurately count them. And uh, the placement, I think it's one of the unique, again, a rapid uh, pacing. And with a rapid pacing, you see the balloon nice. coming up? Very nice, yeah. And I think we learn uh, to deflate the balloon uh, before you stop the rapid pacing. And I think that's those uh, sync videos tells you that this is when you don't see flow. So suddenly, you started to see flow. And I think that's the moment what you're anxiously waiting. And uh, the next thing what I wanted to show you that... So flow came back. <laughs> Yes, but hold on. So you are looking at the nice AI, and what does it tell you that my end diastolic flow is not there? So almost your TCD oh. tells you the brain is still not happy. Probably your gradient, probably your contrast also tell you the same thing, that you need to pulse balloon. Mm -hmm. And while you're pulse ballooning again, you want to get a better signal and better diastolic flow. And I think before you okay. uh, go, go home and be happy, I think y this is what you want to see, a nice, all right. And diastolic flow, and this is where end of the case. Uh, okay, we so we are running out of time, Dr. Grammy. Give me, show me some other convincing examples in your experience. Well, uh, this is just the one of our recent case. Uh, I wanted to show you when we're using the Impala uh, uh, catheter. Help me with that slide and tell me what I'm looking at. This is your TCD yep. showing you multiple emboli on both sides. And what is unique that we have an Impala controller telling you how much your uh, uh, so uh, flow volume is. So top right is the Impala is. controller. And I think uh, mm. uh, within two slides, it will go to commercial break in a second. When you change, you can see the seven uh, uh, flow setting. This is a little bit more than three liters. You see just one single emboli. But if you go under three liters, you don't see any emboli. And another thing I want oh, you to so notice, you see this non-positive flow pattern? Yeah more positive flow pattern when you decrease the impala volume. So I think the because shape the of the mm. the shape of the waveform is described by this PI value. This PI mm -hmm. tell you how positive is your flow. All right. But I think that's a little bit beyond me <laughs> in understanding that. I think you um, I, that's I'm sorry. case I know about, but let's take a little break before you before yes. you go on to that. Uh, take a break for a minute. Hello, I'm William Zogby, Chair of the Department of Cardiology at Houston Methodist DeBakey and Heart and Vascular Center. I'd like to invite you to join us in Houston, Texas for the ninth annual Multimodality Cardiovascular Imaging for the Clinician. This special event will be held on February 22nd to 24th, 2019 
at the Houston Methodist Research Institute in the Texas Medical Center. Cardiovascular imaging plays a vital role in the management of cardiovascular patients. Knowledge of the various imaging modalities is indeed critical in understanding their advantages, limitations, and appropriate utilization. This is in patients with ischemic heart disease, heart failure, cardiomyopathy, valvular heart disease, as well as aortic disease. In addition to didactic lectures by world experts from this country and abroad, this two and a half day symposium offers small group tutorials, each imaging modality, demonstrating heart anatomy to better visualize and understand cardiac and valvular structures, along with other imaging modalities. The course is designed for physicians, mid-levels, nurses, trainees specializing in cardiovascular disease. We also encourage nurses, sonographers, imaging technologists, and echocardiographers, cardiac CT, and MRI specialists to attend. I hope you will join us for this conference and look forward to seeing you in Houston in February. For more details, please visit our website. Okay, well, welcome back. And we have one more question uh, on the line. I'm going to give that to Dr. Grammy. Hello. Thank you so much for calling hey in. Hey, guys. Hey. Hi. Hey, Dr. Grammy and Dr. Lumpson. This is Joe Basha. Uh, first of all, my compliments to you on an excellent program and, uh, and uh, broadcast. Uh, it was very pleasant to watch. And uh, technically, uh, even though the, you, the glitches probably seem bigger to you than it did to us out here in web world, but it came across very well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a couple of things. Yeah, yes, yes, sir. Th a couple of things. One is, you know, in the community environment, you know, you're down in the medical center and you want to do TCD on every single one of your carotids, no problem. In the community setting, however, there's a lot of turf that's in there. You've got the surgeon's turf, you've got the anesthesia turf, you've got nursing turf, you've got administrative turf which means money, um, and then you have, you know, what is really in the best interest of the patient. Notwithstanding, I agree, is a 1%, 2 3% stroke rate good? No, it should be zero. But the argument will always be how is identifying what happened that caused the stroke going to help us prevent a stroke? Okay, so, so let me take that on. I go to our morbidity and mortality meeting, you know, on a monthly basis. Every month there are strokes, and every month I hear the same discussion. It could have been when we cannulated, it could have been a clamp, it could have been the perfusionist doesn't know what he's doing, it could have been anesthesia, and the short answer is nobody really knows. The patient wakens up with a stroke. And fundamentally, if all I can do is point you in the direction of where it's likely to have come from, then I think that moves the ball. You know, if, you know, for example, we find that we cannulate and there's a massive amount of embolization, then obviously should we be using epicardial echo or epiotic echo to try and find out where we're uh, cannulating? If it happens from the cardiopulmonary bypass, then maybe it's you know a perfusionist problem. Um, and so I, these are the things that I think help you identify the likely events that are causing stroke. And then you can focus mm -hmm. on it. And the other part of this is it is highly sensitive when there's no emboli in a phase of the procedure. And I'll guarantee you the stroke didn't happen at that point in time. So so you know I, I've heard this argument. I give you this example of Zolt identifying an occlusion of a middle cerebral artery. You know, identifying that is the difference between that patient waking up um, non-hemiplegic versus hemiplegic. So I do think it mm -hmm. helps you in that respect. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, that's, I mean, I, I, I think that's an excellent, very comprehensive answer. I agree with you 100%, but the, uh, the real world of the community environment seems uh, uh, it, that that kind of logic uh, seems still quite challenging for people to recognize, yeah. but so, I think there's an opportunity. So, of course, the other thing that's coming your way, Joe, is uh, public reporting of cardiac surgery outcomes along with stroke rate. And so <coughs> I think what you're about to find is a massive change in focus. As um, soon as we take the veil off what, what is going on, and, and just remember, what is being reported is type 1 strokes. If all of a sudden we start having them, you know, report, you know, any evidence of type 2 strokes, for example, the Taber world, I will say, 
you know, imagine if you had to go to a patient and say, well, there's about a 70% chance you're going to have a stroke. No, no, you don't have to worry about those strokes because um, it's just killing part of your brain. But, you know, it's a very <laughs> difficult conversation with patients, actually. So I think it's really helped us um, focus on this. So hopefully very good. let us finish off really what's going on here. And also I wanted, I wanted to answer, and, and I think the previous question was how to train. And I think uh, the number, what I can impress you with, is we have probably 15,000 vascular lab in a country. There was only 80 mm -hmm. TCD labs. So until not every vascular lab be able to perform TCD, we do need to educate people. And I think uh, one of my advertisements will be that definitely we'll have a TCD uh, boot camp in uh, front of your ISCVS meeting. So this is where uh, we continuously uh, uh, do our education part. And uh, indeed, you can find us, uh, then we can continue to train uh, uh, people uh, how to do TCD. All because right. I think the training very will Close it out. Impress me with I something that's going to say, I got to have okay. transcranial Doppler. Thank you, Joe, for calling in. Uh, we're just really running out of time. And right now, I just want to show you the best example how the hem hemodynamic information gives you a real clue. This patient is awake, sitting, and watch what happens. Can we get the sound on the computer? The patient is reporting that I'm getting dizzy, lightheaded. He puts his arm down and the flow comes back. And I just want to show you one more time. Uh, this is what happens when he lifts up his arm. His PC signal disappears so and he's immediately <laughs> reporting lightheadedness and dizziness. Okay, so let me qualify this. This is a patient who was sent to me, had been seen multiple places, and the patient said, every time I lift my right arm up, I get dizzy. What does the physician universally do? Think you're crazy. How can that possibly be? And then you basically put the transcranial Doppler probe on what? On the PCA. Posterior because I wanted to see the posterior circulation. And you make him put his arm in this position, and he tells you, oh my gosh, the symptoms are coming back. And you immediately go, here's, what, uh -huh, here's why you're dizzy. There's no flow in your posterior circulation. And not only that, but there was a normal angiogram was done on yep. that arm. All right. And I think that's another uh, comparison that why so you do your angios, uh, you still see. Yeah, you do an angiogram static and it's crazy. Okay, so go ahead. We're about to have to close this out. Don't worry about these angiograms. If you want to know what we did, then you're going to have to come back for something completely different. Okay. Yes, and when I'm not in OR, this is when you're going to see us do remote uh, uh, TCD. And finally, I just want to thank to our team because, again, uh, we have 16 sonographers in our lab. And we just celebrated the 48th anniversary two years ago. And uh, special thanks to our VPs who making us this equipment available for us. So all right. So thank you for all the support. And uh, this is how we can make pleasure. our So work. let me try and, try and summarize here. So we started off with the question is, how are we going to detect cerebral embolization? What I'm going to say is that TCD is the only test that tells us about cerebral embolization um, during the course of a procedure. And the question you always get is, okay, so what? Why is that important? Well, I think what Lansky said is a lot of these emboli, maybe not all of them, that's something we need to define, are associated with causing dead brain. Number three, as you always hear, well, there's nothing I can do about it. Well, you've demonstrated that is absolutely not the case. There are multiple things that you can actually do about it. And here's an example of detecting flow. You also showed an example of a patient with a cardiac arrest who had CPR, which everybody would observe as having CPR, but it was an effect of CPR. They were not perfusing in their brain. And the other two questions were, are those of practicality? I don't have Dr. Grammy here to place the head frame. I think there's technology in the form of those robots coming down the line that will automatically, and that's actually being funded uh, by the US military because they're interested in brain injury in, in soldiers. And finally is the question of, well, who's gonna interpret this? And I think that increasingly you're going to be able to, much like EEG, when you do an EEG, the guy who interprets it's not sitting in the corner of the operating room, they're in a remote monitoring center. And I think we're going to be moving in that direction. So thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, thank you, Dr. Grammy, for your expertise. I think your time has come that people are going to realize that TCD you know, is an important way of minimizing the risk of stroke during these, um, these um, highly embologenic procedures. Thank you very much for uh, listening to us tonight. Thank you. Pleasure working with you, boss. Yeah.